This is episode 238 of the Beyond the Food Show, and today we're going to talk about sugar craving, sugar addiction, and sugar and inflammation, all sugary things. Ready? Stay tuned. Welcome to the Going to Beyond the Food Show. I'm Stephanie Dozier, clinical nutritionist and emotional eating expert, creator of the Going to Beyond the Food Method, and founder of the Going to Beyond the Food Academy corporate executive turned health expert with my own journey with weight, body image, and food, it's now my mission to help smart, successful women like you live confidently right now and unconditionally. Ready, sister? Let's do this. Welcome back, sisters. Hope you're doing well. Now, this episode is loaded. I'm aiming for 30 minutes, but I don't know how long it's going to take. So I'm hoping to fit that in in 30 minutes. So I want to give you a little bit of background as to how I came up with the concept of this episode. But first, before I get to this, I have two announcements to make for you today. Uh, It is the time of the year where we're opening up our 101 program. And I want to very quickly um, share with you what they are. One of them is Conquer and Tribe. This is where I work with my client, the regular woman who want to make peace with food and body accordingly to our methodology that's called Going Beyond the Food. We uh, take a new one-on-one client twice a year, and this is the time of the year. So we will put the link in the show notes for you to submit your application. This is by application. Um, We get onto a call together, me and you, we make sure it's the right fit for you, make sure it's the right fit for me. And then we move on to registration from there. And if you are a health professional, uh, that's another segment of my business, as you probably noticed, for some of you, we are releasing a podcast episode design for professional. Uh, If you are a professional and you want to uh, perfect your professional skills in the world of intuitive eating, body image, mindset, emotional intelligence, and mindfulness, you can apply for a mentorship program, which again opens only twice a year. And this is the time of the year right now for this. And again, it's by application. We get on the phone together, you and I, and we make sure it's the right fit. So if you can't find the link or you need more information, feel free to email us at info at stephaniedoze.com. Now back to sugar craving. So a few weeks ago, I had an epiphany. So give you the context. um, When people join our community, so our community is a virtual community, it's online, it's via email. So when people join our community, and we send you our get started guide, And then I ask you a question in that email where I deliver the guide, which is, what is your number one food struggle? And for most of the email, I reply. Some of you probably got my personal reply with a short video. And I welcome you and I give you specific resources to your number one struggle. And so a couple weeks ago, I was entering those emails, do it about once or twice a week, and... I realized that six out of the 10 people I was replying to, their struggle was some derive of sugar, sugar craving, sugar addiction. Um, and I had no specific resource to send them to. So I'm like, I got to create a podcast episode on this. So there we go. We are here creating this together. So if you are someone that got referred to this episode because of an email, this is it. It's because of you and it's especially for you. Um, So I also went to our social media and I love social media for this because you can ask questions to people and get a very quick answer. Uh, So I asked our followers on Facebook and Instagram to share with me their question about sugar craving. So thank you to all of you that also contributed to this email, to this, sorry, podcast. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, We're going to talk about the dichotomy of food. We're going to talk about nutritionism, nutritionism. That's a big word for me. Uh, and then we're going to answer some questions. Is it bad to have a sugar craving, sugar addiction? Why sugar le- lead to binges? 
What is my body trying to tell me when I crave sugar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ready? Let's do this. Now, before we get started, <laughs> one more thing. This is going to be a um, reference-based, evidence-based episode. So this is the geeky side of me that's coming out. So all the references, the studies, the research paper, the article will be in the show note. You can go to stephaniedozi.com slash 238. So when I refer to a study, it will be there. Now, let's do this. So what is the dichotomy of food? So first of all, dichotomy is when we put good against bad, when we label food as good or bad. And that's a basic human behavior, a defense mechanism that we have because dichotomy makes us feel safe. Vilifying food, the bad food, is a method of simplifying our food choices. Eat the good, restrict the bad. And it's okay. Like, it's not a bad thing, but we have to understand that by doing this, we are creating restriction in our life. We may make our life simple based on assumption, not facts, but by doing that, we miss a lot. Now, if you want to know more about dichotomy of food, start or go back to episode 199, and I did a show just on that. Now, dichotomy of food shows up as... Back 30 years ago, fat is bad. Do you guys remember that? Are you old enough for that? <laughs> I was raised during those years, right? I was ra raised in the 80s and we had, as a society, a fear of fat. It was a threat to human existence. And we created food and diet program and medication and entire health program were built on the fear of fat. And back then, the claim was, we now have science to prove it. Fast forward to today, we have a completely different perspective on fat, right? Dietary fat is okay. And we've realized the errors of our ways and the limitation of science back then. As science evolved and we continued to study, we realized that fat wasn't bad. And that our research that we thought was correct was actually incorrect. Now it's sugar. Hmm, pause here for a minute. Put that into perspective. Remember that diet culture, weight loss industry, and even the wellness industry thrives on general public fear of fatness, fat phobia, right? Our last episode was all about that. And from there, these industry creates fear mongering that is, quote, based on science to help you fuel this fear of fatness, this fear of gaining weight. And it then creates a capitalism industry behind that ways of making money based on your fear. And that's, that's the premise of Diet culture, right? For those who are new here, diet culture is a system of beliefs that equate tenderness to health and to moral virtue. Diet culture encouraged weight loss as the mean of achieving this thinness and by demonizing, this is where we link that back into sugar, by demonizing certain food and ways of eating. That's the base of dieting, right? Good and bad food, good and bad macro bland, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, creating a diet that support weight loss, that, a, that support this ideal of thinness that we have in society. And diet culture, just like the weight loss industry, thrives on fear mongering. And also, very important for us as female, it thrives on the fact that we have a low self-esteem due to our beliefs around what our body should look like. Now, diet culture also thrives on pseudo science. And this is key here. Remember, 30 years ago, fat was bad, sugar was okay. Today, sugar is bad and fat is okay. If it was science, 
true science, fat would still be bad. Now, this is where I want to kind of be sure that all of you understand that there is science. That is absolutely true. However, the interpretation of the actual finding in science is what is leading us to these errors. Not everybody in the public, not everyone in the media is capable of reading true scientific literature. There's entire courses given to that in our education, in, in a nutrition education. We have courses on just reading science. General population is not able to do that. Media, in most cases, aren't able to do that. So we create assumption that is marketed to promote diet culture, weight loss industry, and the wellness industry as well. We completely negate principle like correlation versus causation. We present study that link correlation as causation. And then we create an entire way of eating based on that. When in fact, when you look at the study, it doesn't even say that. Now, here's another aspect I want you to think about before we get into the question. And there's a quote here from a lady, uh, a scientific um, writer. Her name is Margaret Mead. And she said, People don't eat nutrition, they eat food. And that's a quote I want to introduce the concept of nutritionism to you. Nutritionism is the reductionist approach to food. This is when we focus only on nutrient, isolated food components, or isolated blood or biomarker, like for an example, saturated fat or cholesterol, as a way of indicating health, as a way of making decision about health, making decision about nutrition. While we only look at the one nutrient, we completely abstract out the entire context of the food. There is no food in this planet that comes just as one nutrient. It's always, in most cases, three macronutrient together. Carbohydrate, aka sugar, fats, and protein. Furthermore, when we look at only one biomarker, we completely abstract out the entirety of the human body and its entire complex bodily system. We completely negate that we are a whole human made out of mental, emotion, spiritual, and yes, physical body. Now, the upside of nutritionism has been the discovery of drugs and vitamins and minerals, which absolutely has saved millions of life. However, the downside of nutritionism is that modern civilization, mainly American, are obsessing over the detail like percentage of fats and carbohydrate they consume rather than focusing on the big picture. Fat is bad 30 years ago, today sugar is bad is the prime example of that. We can look back in the 80s and we were vilifying eggs, like this whole food created by nature as being this evil food. Can we look back and say, oh my God, right? Are we now doing that with sugar? Now, why am I sharing nutritionism in the context of answering the question, is sugar bad or even sugar addictive? Well, because that's what the basis of the belief we have around sugar are from today. The fear mongering that creates all the question around sugar come from there. And the weight loss industry and diet culture takes these fear and they hemp it up in media 
to create even more fear in you for you to subdue to their diet and their beliefs around weight and good and bad food and to make you even more obsessed about food where you lose touch with your intuition, with your innate wisdom. Now for the professional listening to that, that was my episode of season one and episode one of the pro series. First, do no arm. The way in which we are as professional teaching, applying, recommending nutrition today is from nutritionism. So we have to be extremely careful not to cause harm by putting out what we believe is fact, where in fact is not into the world. And I was guilty of that the first few years of my clinical practice. And I talk about that in the episode, so you may want to go and listen to this. So let's get into the topic of sugar craving. Let's get into the topic of why our body craves sugar. Let's talk about sugar addiction, food addiction even, and this whole relationship between inflammation and sugar craving. So I'm going to attempt to answer three questions here. Why does our body crave sweets? Can sugar craving be present as a form of hunger? And is it bad to have a sugar craving? So fact is, 95% of the time, it is not your body that craves sugar, but your mind. Your body asks for nutrients, for protein, for fats, for carb. It doesn't ask for sugar. So it's not your body, your biology that craves sugar. It's your mind. I didn't say that sugar craving were bad, right? Don't let your brain take you there. I said that your biology doesn't crave sugar most of the time. Now there is this, again, there's no perfect rule of 100% of the time. It's not true. Now there is time where for some people, their body does crave sugar because they're in a state of hypoglycemia. So their thought will become completely obsessed with sugar because they're crashing. And if they don't have the most efficient source of carbohydrate in that moment, they'll pass out. So it's not true that it's only our mind, but most of the time it is. Now, why does our mind want sugar? Because it's delicious, right? It stimulates our taste bud and it stimulates the reward system in our brain. It gives us a good experience. We are wired to want sweet food, because sweet food are dense in calorie, and that equals our survival. Our brain also wants sugar because it's forbidden, right? We put restriction around it, and the human brain wants everything that's forbidden. Hence why later on we'll talk about when we remove restriction around food, all of a sudden, we don't want as much sugar, Right? We, our minds want sugar because it does, makes us feel good. It gives us a rush of dopamine. And there's this concept of dopamine deficiency. When we don't take care of ourselves well, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, like when we don't have a good self-care routine, we crave more dopamine. And if the only way that you as a human get dopamine into your body is through food, you're going to crave more food because what in fact you're craving is not food. It's the dopamine that the eating experience provides you with. Your mind craves sugar because for some of us, sugar has been a form of comfort and perhaps a very traumatic background, perhaps a very emotionally loaded life, perhaps in a state of not knowing what to do with our emotion, our body has hooked on to the good experience that sugar is giving us and the good emotion that sugar is giving us because the rest of our life is not such 
a good emotional experience because sugar has kept you in your comfort zone. It allowed you to survive. The truth is the human brain is wired to want what has allowed you to survive before. So if consuming sugar, having a dopamine rush of sugar before has allowed you to survive what your brain believed to be dangerous situation, it will want more sugar. As soon as you are or believed to be in a state of danger, your brain will want more sugar. Now, how does intuitive eating deal with this craving aspect of sugar? Number one, intuitive eating if you're new here, it's an entire eating self-care framework that puts you back in touch with your innate hunger, fullness, and satisfaction cue. It makes you the boss of you, right? In an intuitive eating approach, we remove the conditioning around food, the good or bad. Food becomes neutral, right? So we stop want or wanting what is forbidden. And then we reconnect back to our innate wisdom that all of us have. All of you listening right now have an internal nutritionist within you that knows what to eat, when to eat, and how much to eat. And the process of intuitive eating shift that power from the guru, the expert, and diet culture back to you. Let's go into the second block. Sugar addiction. So we're going to answer is sugar addictive, is sugar craving real and dangerous? And why does when I eat sugar, it leads to a binge spiral? So let's tackle addiction. So there is, ready for this, zero scientific evidence that sugar is addictive, specifically in human Research does argue, argue, not prove, correlation versus causation. Research does argue utilizing the Yale Food Addiction Scale to evaluate the addiction to food or to sugar. However, and the biggest however here, it doesn't take into account dieting behavior restriction of any kind. That's not built into the addiction scale. And that's where the food addiction scale does not take into account the individual experience around food. What we know around or about brain, what it's called neuroscience, right? The science of the study of the brain is that Restriction causes food thoughts and obsession of food and uncontrollable urges to eat. So when we restrict sugar, we cause obsessive thoughts about sugar and then uncontrollable urges of eating sugar. And then we fall into a survival mode in our brain. Now, By me saying that there is no sustainable evidence around sugar addiction doesn't negate the fact that perhaps you feel addicted to sugar, right? Many women will express to me in their, in their email that they feel quote out of control around sugar or other food. Being or feeling out of control is a very different state than addiction. And that's what in media is binded together. They say that if you feel out of control, that means you're addicted. That is so false. Yes, you do feel out of control because you restrict the sugar, the element, which spins you back into obsessive thought about that forbidden food, then uncontrollable urges comes along. Here's another belief around sugar. And, And people will often say that, well, I read a study. I always giggle when I hear that. I read a study somewhere that said that sugar lights up the same region of the brain as cocaine. So, Again, very little people 
know how to read study. And it's not your job. You should not know how to read study. You haven't been trained for it. You have a completely different profession. You should not know. Here's the truth about this supposedly science around that region of the brain that lights up like cocaine, like sugar is addictive as cocaine. Number one, all the studies have been done on rats. I'm pausing here for a reason. There's no human study on sugar and addiction and reaction of the brain to sugar. So first. Second, those rats... There was a good study on rats, and those rats were divided up into three groups, which is the right way of doing study, right? A group of rats was given sugar liberally. Another group of rat was having a no sugar, right? And then the third group had restricted access to sugar. They were mimicking the dieting sugar restriction, right? Give them a little bit, stop giving it to them, and so forth. Well, guess what the study found? The addiction behavior of the rat around sugar were only present in the group that had a restricted access to sugar. Pause again. Let me repeat that. The addictive behavior around sugar were only present in the group of rat that had a restricted access to sugar on and off, just like dieting does. Now, about this whole concept of lighting up the reward center of the brain, it's true. Sugar does light up the reward center, just like any food does. That's how human have been able to survive Hundreds of thousands of years ago up to now, we like to eat because eating equal our survival. Any eating activity lights up the reward center of the brain because it makes us to want more. And for thousands and thousands of years, that's all we did, right? We chase, hunted, eated, Chase until he did sleep. <laughs> Did a little bit of other things, populated the planet, and then started the cycle again. Because we like to eat. And it's true that sugar, when measured, lights up more the reward center, just like other activity. And I'll let you think of what those other activity might be. Not everything stimulate the reward center at the same level. That doesn't mean that sugar is addictive. That's not a proof. Now let's talk about food addiction in general, right? So I talked about in the beginning of this segment about the Yale food addiction scale, right? And the elements that it's missing, hence why there is not a clear conclusion that food addiction is a real thing. Now, food and drugs do share the same neural pathway in the brain, but the brain does not develop physiological dependency on food substance. That's the conclusion of the study. Now, there is a lot of marketing and headline and what we call sweeping statement that leads you to believe that you can be addicted to food. Now, I want to present this to you in a different perspective. Many people are addicted to alcohol. They're what we call alcoholic. Let's take wine or beer for an example, right? These folks have an addictive behavior that has negative consequence on their life when they consume alcohol. Yet, there is this other group of people who consume the same substance, beer, wine, and does not have uncontrollable urges and behavior, quote, not addicted to alcohol. Is alcohol the problem? Pause. No, it's the individual. 
And their baggage, the way their brain is wired, their emotional state, their trauma that makes them use alcohol to numb pain. Go to the food. Yes, there is individual who uses food to numb pain. Does that make food an addictive substance? I'll leave it at that. So one more thing on sugar addiction and food addiction. I did a collaboration with a sugar addiction specialist a few years back. Um, and we, she, Bitten Johnson, put me through a complete assessment on sugar addiction and food addiction. And uh, we also tested the going to be on the food method. And we recorded the whole thing, right? So if you want access, if you want to dig deeper in this food addiction, sugar addiction, uh, you can go to the show notes. It's podcast 161, I believe. But I would highly recommend that you watch the video version, which is attached in the show notes, because Bitten shows you the assessment and her conclusion is quite remarkable in which she, through my result, has never seen these types of results. And the reason is, is that you're looking at me, that was probably two to three years ago, having gone through what is now called the going to beyond the food method for years, right? So you can clearly see how I was before and how I am now. And that pretty much proves that the problem is not the substance, it was me, right? And through the going to be on the food method, the work that I had done on my mind, on my emotion, my spiritual body and my physical body led me to no longer have any symptoms. So um, go watch the video. Let's go to the next block. Why do I crave sugar? What is my body trying to tell me when I crave sugar? And why do people say when you eat less sugar, you crave less sugar? Now, many people on that last statement believe that when you eliminate sugar, when you drastically reduce the consumption of it, it makes you, quote, less addicted. The truth is it actually enhances your reward response. It makes you want more. This is the same phenomenon as dieting. Just like diet works short term, right? People do lose weight at first, and then they regain the weight loss and some more. Restricting sugar works short term, I don't know, three days, three weeks, three months, and all of a sudden, this powerful human biology that we all have will win over willpower and you will crave sugar and you will go back to the on and off chaotic relationship around sugar. And then you'll say, see, sugar is addictive. See, sugar is bad for me. See, I can't control myself with sugar. It's because you restricted sugar. Problem is not sugar. It's your behavior around sugar that's a problem. By getting you to restrict sugar, what diets do, and at the bigger level, diet culture does, is it proves to you that you are powerless, that you're not good enough to know what to eat, when to eat, and how much to eat. So you have to rely on those gurus and buy the product and the books and the things because you're not good enough. It keeps you in that low self-esteem bucket. So what does it mean when you crave sugar? In the world of intuitive eating, we call that a body message. It's a sign for you to look deeper, to look at your relationship to sugar. Body messages comes in different form, right? For those that are new here, Think of body messages as perhaps having a fever, right? Is having a higher bodily temperature a bad thing? No, it's a sign that something else is going on within your body. Your immune system is ramping up, perhaps because you have a virus. 
It's not a bad thing. Craving sugar is not a bad thing. It's a sign to get you to look deeper. Now, I fully understand that many of us do not have the tools to look deeper. And that's what intuitive eating brings to you. It helps you connect with food at a much deeper level. It focuses on the why. And it helps you engage with food at that innate level. It also, intuitive eating, gives you the permission to eat. It removes all these rules and say, let's experience food for what it is without those labels. Intuitive eating is a recovery framework from these years of dieting, these years of believing that sugar was bad. And if you're older, that fat was bad right? It gets you to recover a proper mindset around food, built emotional intelligence, and brings you to that place where you can become your own internal nutritionist. Okay, last block. Is sugar inflammatory? What about the health protocol that my health guru gave me to eliminate my health condition that comes from removing sugar for the rest of my life, right? Let's talk about this whole health and inflammation notion around sugar. So first of all, I did an entire, not an entire podcast, but a good segment of a podcast around hormonal health and intuitive eating. And we dived deep into inflammation. So that's podcast 209. You may want to go back and look that up. But know this, the wellness industry, which is primarily the industry or um, the segment of health that promotes this sugar drives inflammation in the body and inflammation drives disease into the body is just like diet culture is fear mongering around how much sugar contributes to inflammation in the body. But hear me out on this. First of all, inflammation is a natural healing system of your body. So if you're new here, inflammation is what happened when, for example, let's say you have a paper cut, right? You cut your finger with paper, your finger will become all reddish. Perhaps there'll be a little bit of blood coming out. It'll be throbbing. That's inflammation. Now, that same process happens internally into the body. That's how your body healed itself. Inflammation is the process of healing. Now, how much inflammation you have, where you have inflammation, when you have it, all these questions will then determine if you are in a state of I don't want to say danger, but in the state of perhaps too much inflammation in that one sector of your body, in that one sector of your health, this is not things that we can do as general population. This is when you go see a specialist who will assess you with tests, with intake process, with symptomology to tell you if there's perhaps inflammation in the wrong part of your body or too much inflammation. It's not as simple as just removing sugar to then eliminate inflammation. Inflammation is caused by so many things in the human experience, right? If it was just sugar, oh my God, life would be simple. Inflammation is triggered by the amount of sleep you have, the thoughts you carry in your brain, the emotion you experience, the hair you breathe, the coffee you drink, like so many things, including body dissatisfaction. Yep. We are starting, not we, me, but there's people starting to study the side effect of weight stigma or fat phobia in, in, in relationship to how we think about our body. And there's a very, very small study, right, that has been done that looked at what happens internally in people's body when they have negative body image thought, or what we call dissatisfaction of body image. Well, 
what they did is they measured one thing. See, I'm being very careful how I cite this study. Small study, and they measured only one biomarker, the biomarker called cortisol, which is the hormone of stress. And they went in and they triggered people to have negative body image thought, and then they went in and measured cortisol. Guess what they found? That people who experience negative body thoughts, in some cases, had higher cortisol. So there is a link between our body image and our perception of our body and the level of stress in our body. I think most women who struggle with their body image already know that. But it's just a scientific glimpse at what's going on internally. But guess what? The reason why I'm talking about this here is because cortisol drives higher level of inflammation in the body, right? So when they went in in that study and measure CRP, which is the main marker of inflammation, they found higher level of inflammation. So yes, there is more than one thing that drives inflammation. So what does research or study say about sugar and inflammation? So yeah, there is study that have been done and performed around um, the contribution of sugar to inflammation. And I've cited one study in the show note, and just to put things in perspective for you, because you don't read the actual study, but the study that pointed out to the correlation between the two was actually a study that was done in isolation, meaning that they took human and they made them drink isocaloric sugary drink. So solution that were created in lab between water and a form of sugar, nothing else, just water and sugar. And they tested actually three forms of sugar, fructose, glucose, and sucrose. So they took individual, made them drink those drink, and then looked at the CRP marker in the individual. Can you see the problem here? Drinking sugary solution made out of water and glucose or sucrose or fructose is not real life. Who drinks sugary water? (laughs) Nobody does that or very little people, right? When you look at the form of sugar and how it's presented in our life, even a cookie, for example, has protein and fat in it. Even the piece of cake you're eating has protein, fat, and yes, sugar in it. And guess what? We know that when we blend in sugar with protein and fat, it's a different absorption. It's a different reaction in the human body. We did talk about that in our podcast episode that talked about intuitive eating and diabetes podcast. 229, I interviewed two diabetes specialists, and we talked about why intuitive eating is such a good um, collaborator with people that have diabetes. So, so many things cause inflammation. Pure form of sugar drank in excess does drive up inflammation, but that's not real life. That's not how we engage with sugar in our life. So what do we do in the world of intuitive eating when it comes to nutrition and health and inflammation? We do talk about it, but we talk about it at the end of the process of recovery. We first need to repair the collateral damage of dieting. We need to reset our relationship to food. We need to reconnect to our innate eating cues. We need to stop judging food, right? Once we're gone through that process of healing, then we can start talk about health and nutrition. And when you look at the original intuitive eating book, we do talk about gentle nutrition at the end, the 10th step out of 10. But when we do We don't teach you to make food decision based on rules, but then we say, how does that food makes you feel? How do you respond to that food in your body? We don't make assumption that your body reacts like everyone else. And that's how intuitive eating talks about nutrition and health. 
So what is the conclusion here? Everyone, almost everyone, would agree that a daily excessive intake of sugar isn't necessarily conducive to health. However, excessive is extremely different than enjoying a piece of fruit, chocolate, or even maple syrup, or even that birthday cake, or even that dessert at the restaurant with your loved one. That is not excessive. And it's not the same as what causes perhaps health issue. Now, when we go back and say, no, 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 that's not true. That's not what research says. Remember that what research links is often studies in animals. It's often not taking into account food relationship, restriction, dieting. And it's also not made out of eating whole food, just like the study we looked at. It's a single form of water and sugar. That's not the intuitive eating life. Now, for those of you who have begun the process of intuitive eating and say, well, Stephanie, now that I've released the rules, all I want is sugar. I will say, yes, sister, that's right. That's what is supposed to happen. That's what we call the pendulum, right? When you release the rules, when you are in the process of recovering a normal relationship to food and you allow yourself all the foods, your brain will drive you to eat sugar a lot, but the pendulum will start swinging back to a mindful, normal relationship to sugar. So just stick with it, be patient and ride the wave. I hope this podcast helped you and answer most of your question around sugar. And if I miss one, please uh, let me know via social media or email and be sure to refer out to all the sustainable evidence in the show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with someone that needs to hear this message. Remember that the Beyond the Food movement is a grassroots movement. We need all of you to share this information. And the next podcast episode is going to be a interview with Anne Killing, one of our students, and she will be sharing her intuitive eating journey. She's been on this journey for three years now and her experience from reading the book to working through our program and how that has changed her relationship to food. So I love you, sister, and I look forward to hang out with you on the next episode.